Please be seated. We're on the record in case CV 140816, Zelkind et al. versus Dell Webb et al. This is the time set for oral argument. Council, you both have 20 minutes to present your case. Council for the appellant, which is uh, Mr. Hulson. No. Mr. Nebaker. Mr. Nebaker. Um, if you need to set aside uh, some time for rebuttal, just let us know. You have a clock up on the on the stand up there that uh, helps you keep track of time. We have reviewed your briefs. We've reviewed the record, so we're very familiar with the issues in this case. One last thing I want to uh, caution you about. These proceedings are being recorded, uh, audio and visually recorded, and they'll be uploaded to our website so people can watch these proceedings on the Internet in a couple of days. So keep that in mind. Okay, Mr. Nebaker, your argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Um, today's uh, appeal essentially deals with the issue of the Purchaser Dwelling Act. Um, its interpretation, implementation, and its compliance. Um, it's an important decision, uh, hopefully, for the residential uh, home building community because, there, as you know, and as we've said in our briefs, uh, there's been a number of modifications, amendments to the Act over the years, but there really hasn't been any uh, substantial cases that deal with how the act works, how it's complied with, things of that nature. So that's why we're here in large part to try to get some definition on what it is and how it works and things of that nature. Let me jump right in there because I'm not sure this is the case that's going to get you there because let's look at the basis upon which you opposed the plaintiff's request for post-trial attorney's fees. Um, this is the biggest record I've ever seen. We've got over 3,000 uh, items of record, but at item of record 2871, you opposed their fee request post-trial because they didn't analyze successful party status on a plaintiff-by-plaintiff -plaintiff basis, the requested sums were unreasonable, and their lawyer had a conflict of interest. Why would we then engage on appeal in an analysis of whether their pre-trial demand, notice, whatever you want to characterize it as was sufficient? It was raised twice in the record before. It was raised. It was raised before, but it wasn't raised at the time that the fee request was made. And and you have not addressed Judge Reyes's substantive ruling on that point on appeal. Nor has it been appealed. And there are circumstances where denial of a motion for partial summary judgment could be appealed. So I'm having a hard time seeing how that issue has been teed up for our review. It's been teed up by virtue of the appeal only because uh, it was raised twice in the underlying case, first in front of Judge Reyes, and secondly in front of uh, Judge Oberbilling, both times. Uh, where, where was it raised in front of Judge Oberbilling? Because I've read that entire transcript. I've read the post-trial filings on attorney's fees, and there was discussion of law of the case, but it was in quite different context. So maybe, and if you can't do it right now, rebuttal's fine, um, but point me to where in front of Judge Oberbillig this argument was preserved. Five days before the argument for over the fees, we had the same argument over compliance. And that's when we raised Del it. Webb's compliance, yes. No, the compliance as well by... Well, that's what I want you to point me to, because I see all over the map where you talked about Del Webb's compliance. I get that, but... but the flip side is what I'm interested in, and so maybe you can point me to well, that. Well, we raised it in our motion for summary judgment in front of Judge Reyes, and then there was a motion for stay in front of Judge Oberbilling when the plaintiffs in another case called Richards made the argument that compliance was jurisdictional. And in, in going back and reading Judge Reyes's uh, ruling, in effect, he said compliance is jurisdictional and then ruled that we had waived. And as this court's well aware, we can't confer jurisdiction by a waiver. And so we fast forward then, Judge Reyes goes, and I guess this is similar to your earlier case where the judge, trial judge leaves, um, but Judge Reyes goes on the federal bench and we end up uh, several months later with uh, Judge Oberbilling and that's when 
the same law firm in a different case in federal court made the argument that you can't waive compliance, they can't, when they were making the argument that even though they had complied or attempted to comply with the Purchaser Dwelling Act, they failed to do so, therefore it could be raised any time. And in that hearing, Judge Oberbilling, in effect, then said, and was convinced by the plaintiffs, that in fact the uh, compliance issue, as found by um, Judge Reyes, was in fact that they did comply. And that's, that's, that's addressed in our rebuttal reply brief um, at length because they spent close to 20 pages in their, um, re in their response brief that, that in effect on this issue of waiver. And, and our position quite simply is waiver is non a non-issue based upon judicial estoppel. They can't talk out of both sides of their mouths and say on the one hand it's jurisdictional and on the one hand it's not. The only way we're still in front of this court. Judicial estoppel would apply if you had the exact same parties, but the case you're referring to, different parties. Same issue, though, um, and then puts them in a conflicting position, and that was what the real issue was, is how do we respond on the one hand. Well, I, I get your practical argument, but judicial estoppel, one of the elements is the parties have to be the same, so how do we get past that? Well, in effect, it was the uh, that that is an issue, but I mean, it was still raised, and and, and eventually, the holding by Judge Oberbilling at the behest of the plaintiffs was that, in fact, Judge Reyes found compliance as opposed to waiver, and that's in the transcript that that we've cited. But it is. Pretty convoluted because we've got two different judges. I feel sorry for Judge Overbill. I'm quick putting an N on his name, but well, well, it is sort of an interesting. <laughs> it is a, a, it is an interesting dynamic because Judge Overbilling sort of sat in the same scenario you folks find yourselves in, in that he didn't deal with the case and tried to make decisions. Uh, obviously, now you're in that same same position. Um, but really what I want to turn to first is the first issue, and I'm already way, way too far along than I hope to be in terms of time, um, is, the, is the issue with respect to the Purchaser Dwelling Act's impact on the contracts. There's 142 of the plaintiffs that had contracts with Del Webb, and those 142 contracts contained alternative dispute resolution provisions and also contained how attorney's fees were to be handled. And, and that issue is clearly in front of this court because- Were, were any of those claims uh, referred to alternative dispute resolution, referred to arbitration? No, the plaintiffs waived that and came directly to Pulte or at Pulte Del Webb with their complaint. And so it's our position that they waived their ability to get fees because they chose not to follow the contract when, in fact, the contract controls. And the con but the contract doesn't specifically say anything about fees for a superior court action, does it? It limits the fees to arbitration. Where does it do that? Does Where it, does it say yeah. fees are only recoverable in this context? I, I'm, that's by, the link I'm missing. Well, by saying that this is how every dispute arising out of or related to this contract gets resolved. And presumably Del Webb could have insisted on arbitration or mediation. Del Webb could have, but since they waived it, we chose not to enforce it. So it seems like this provision goes out the window at that point. No, because it's still a contract and it, re it controls how the parties get their fees. I, I think I would be able to follow better if, if if it said these, uh, the only time fees, you know, something like the only, the only availability of attorney's fees is, is if this matter goes to arbitration. And, and that's, that's what it said. It, but it didn't say the only, but it said that's how you get it and the only way you dispute but, this. But without saying, without saying that there, there, there's no availability of attorney's fees, the parties are hereby agree that no attorney's fees will be awarded if this matter goes to superior court litigation without something like that or without some some only kind of language, 
don't we don't we simply drop out that those provisions and move on? No, because the number one, the statute says if it's available, it doesn't say you have to do it. If it's available, the Purchaser Dwelling Act does not apply. So they don't get to that issue. The second issue is by waiving this court would then be giving them something they didn't bargain for, that is fees in litigation. The contract is very specific as to how they get their fees, and you can't allow them and reward them with more than what they bargained for by their choosing not to go that route. Well, but the web chose not to go that route as well. And we didn't seek our fees in this. They can't get their fees, we can't get ours. Only but in that situation. Seek fees under the PDA. The PDA, though, is what we're saying does not apply to this particular, these 142 homeowners. But you sought fees on that basis, too, didn't you? Not under the PDA. Not under for these homes. These homes were, were limited to their... Um, well, okay. Then their their I'm clause completely in the contract. Misreading 2876, it says Del Webb requests an award of 750,000 plus in fees under the Purchaser Dwelling Act. That would have been for the the under the the, the offers of judgment. Well, that was another basis you cited. Yes. Right. Anyway, you can move on. The um. So I guess the the the. the to sum up on that issue, the issue is they try to get more than they bargain for. They can't get it. The statute specifically prohibits altering the contract, and the statute specifically says if alternative dispute resolution doesn't apply or is available, this statute doesn't apply, so they don't get it. Um, with respect to the issue of compliance uh, under the PDA requirements, uh, essentially, I think this court is perfectly aware of the fact that this notice really didn't comply with the statute. I mean, it didn't give us uh, alleged defects described in reasonable detail. It didn't give reasonable detail that meant detailed and itemized list with observed locations. This, this notice was designed by the plaintiff's lawyers to do exactly what it did frustrate the purposes of the PDA, which is to try to give and take and fix things. It was designed pr primarily and entirely to allow them to come in at the end of the case and say there was never an offer made and we are the successful party. The interesting part about the statute is it talks in terms of not prevailing but successful. And the reason why it does that, I believe, is because in an offer and to fix, if I say, okay, I'm gonna fix your roof and we don't settle and the jury comes back and gives you $2,000, how do you know what my offer was? So in a successful party situation, you have to look at the entire um, negotiations, if you will. And this notice was designed to frustrate negotiations so that it never happened. And it really then allow, it ends up uh, waiving or doesn't allow the implementation of attorney's fees because you can't make that determination of who the successful party is and it frustrates the purpose of the Purchaser Dwelling Act by their non-compliance. And, and by non-compliance, I mean you can't even tell what they're asking Del Webb to do in the PDA. It's not just a piece of paper they put in the mail and send to Del Webb. It has to have substance. And in this case, they didn't have it. And I'm, I'm down to seven minutes, so let me uh, turn finally to the third issue, and that's the paper copying uh, costs. Uh, their position is it was an agreement. Uh, there was never an agreement to pay for costs. There was let me an ask you a question, and I intend to, ask, intend to ask them this question, because they represented to the court that there had been a court order for the document depository. As best I can tell, it was simply an agreement of the parties to use a document. Right. Is that right. I don't believe there was ever a court order that said use a document And depository. Judge Overbillick seemed confused about that at argument because he kept talking about a court order and nobody corrected him. So I have some questions for them about that. Let me ask you sort of a bottom line question. If you were to prevail on that issue, the 231,000 plus, does that affect the Rule 68 calculus? It could. 
Thank you. I'll reserve my six minutes. Thank you, Council. Okay, now Mr. Hulson? Hudson. He's so bad with names. I'm, I'd, I'd say I'm the worst with calling out these names, Mr. Hudson, your argument. And, and, and this panel is quick to point out any of my errors on the now, your, your Honor, you are welcome to call me whatever you like. That's, uh, and I believe me, I've been called much worse. Thank you, Mr. Hulson. <laughs> Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, Thomas Hudson on behalf of the plaintiff's appellees. And, and Your Honors, the, the central issue in this case is whether the trial court, Judge Oberbillig, erred by awarding fees, <clears throat> attorney's fees, expert costs, and other costs to the successful party in this action under statute 12-1364 that expressly says the court shall award fees and costs to the successful party. And, and what they're arguing and what we hear today is that there's two reasons that statute doesn't apply. And, and neither of those reasons withstand scrutiny. The first reason, <clears throat> they, they point to the provision in the purchase contracts. And that provision says, in the event of an arbitration, the prevailing party shall recover attorney's fees. In the event of an arbitration. It doesn't say, in the event of a dispute, only the arbitrator may award fees nor does it say that a party may not recover fees that would otherwise be available to it by statute. There's no waiver of any statutory right in that provision. <clears throat> it simply confirms that if there's an arbitration, then the party can also get fees. It's silent on what happens if there's not an arbitration, and therefore the statutes apply. It's that, it's that simple. We don't, we don't have the leeway to infer that if, if they'd intended uh, attorney's fees to be available uh, following a Superior Court action, they, they would have said it. I mean, they obviously, whoever drafted the contract knew how to, knew how to put in an attorney's fees provision. Uh, two, two points to that, Judge Gimmel. Uh, one, there would have to be an abrogation of a statutory right. And two, if you look at the language, I think the only way you can draw the inference that, which basically says, if there's an arbitration, then the successful party gets fees, is to commit a logical fallacy called denying the antecedent. So we would suggest that the court not engage in a logical fallacy to draw that inference. Um, <clears throat> and unless there's further questions on the uh, uh, c uh, contract provision, let me turn to the second reason why they say <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> 1364 doesn't apply, and that's the, the so-called notice issue. And they contend that somehow 1364 doesn't apply, uh, that if you look in the Purchaser Dwelling Act, uh, that, that you can somehow infer that really the way you should read it is that but when, when, the fee, when the time for fees comes along, a trial court can then go back and look at a pre-lawsuit notice that's not to be admitted in evidence and at that time say if there's some deficiency, then I can ignore the language that says shall award the successful parties attorney's fees. And we would submit that to, to get there, you're going to have to add a lot of words to the Purchaser Dwelling Act. You're going to have to essentially rewrite it. Um, <clears throat> so we again would, would suggest you don't go there. And on the merits, the PDA notices in this case are paradigm examples of what you would want in a case like this. But don't you contend that issue is not before us? A absolutely. And, 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 and I'll just finish there, Judge Downing. It, it was absolutely waived. We explained in detail in our answering brief why it was waived. In their reply brief, they do not dispute the merits of our argument at all. They say we can't make that argument because of the doctrine of judicial estoppel, which applies to parties, not attorneys, and there was no inconsistencies between the position taken in the Richards case in this and, case. And what about Mr. Nebaker's argument that in front of Judge, Judge Oberbillig this issue was argued? Okay, so what he's, what he's referring to, and then let, me, let me note, this was a new argument made in the reply, and it's made in footnotes, um, but what, what they're talking about is after, after the fee briefing, okay, no, nothing's, there, no, there's nothing in their fee briefing that's telling Judge Oberbillig, uh, raising this issue with Judge Oberbillig and telling me he can't skip this critical step of the notices, not in their briefing. They file a motion to stay based on 
the Richards case, and they argue, you know, they have this argument that somehow the positions are inconsistent. <clears throat> and in connection with that hearing, uh, Judge Oberbillick says, didn't Reyes find that there's a waiver of the PDA notice issue? And then what they said in their reply brief is because it came up in that context, they had no obligation to point out to Judge Oberbillick that that's also a reason he could not grant fees. That's their argument, and well, it's in the okay. reply and brief. When there was a discussion with Judge Oberbillick about law of the case, as I read the comments by both the lawyers and the court, he was talking about the question of whether Del Webb had complied with the response exactly. slash offer. Th that is exactly correct, Judge Downey, and that was in connection with the attorney's fees, the briefing on the attorney's fees. So there are two hearings, and what they're saying is we raised it in a different hearing in connection with different issues and therefore didn't have to raise the, raise the objection with the trial court in connection with the attorney's fees. And we submit that's, that's not how it works. Um, so, but you're, you're, you read that exactly right, that when the, when the law of the case issues were discussed with Judge Oberbill, again, they had no problem revisiting those issues. They never, they never uh, uh, raised the issue of anything to do with the defective notices. So unless there's questions on their second reason why 1364 doesn't apply, let me, let me turn to the uh, copying costs issue. And, and Judge Downey, um, I too, in getting ready for argument, looked to find uh, something other than the joint pretrial memorandum, and I couldn't find it. So I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to argue here today that there's a court order in addition to the agreement well, but, wasn't Judge Oberbillig possibly misled because the reply said, as for copy costs, this is your client's reply brief, as for copy costs, this case involved a court-ordered document depository. And then Judge Ober Oberbillig's questions to counsel on that point clearly indicate he believed there was a, it was a court-ordered expense. And that I can't find anything in the record that supports that. Well, I, I agree there's no order, but, but um, and maybe I should grab the transcript. My memory of the questions then to... Um, Del Webb's counsel was he his what was wasn't there an agreement and they they acknowledged that there was an agreement and and I think if you go back and look at it you'll see that and and here's the key here's really what matters under uh, 12 1332 a6 and under the Reyes case uh, an excellent opinion don't you think I do I uh, one of the finest I've ever I've ever read um, and and what we have in the Reyes case, like here, you have a joint pretrial memorandum. In the Reyes case, like here, we have the statute which says, and I'm quoting, costs include other disbursements that are made or incurred pursuant to an, <clears throat> an order or agreement of the parties. I totally get that, but let me ask you this. The agreement to use a document depository is not, in my mind, at all synonymous with the notion of then copying $230,000 worth of documents. The whole idea of a document depository is to decrease the reproduction of documents. So I don't know how you can equate an agreement to use a document depository with an agreement because your motion said we want copying costs for... Oh, it was a laundry list of things. Copy costs in service of PDA notices, pleadings, discovery, correspondence to counsel, clients, experts. Yeah, let, 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 me, let me address that, Judge Downey. So, um, uh, your weak point, I believe, in the case. I think our other points are so strong that that might be by a, a proper implication. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, Judge Downey, this is, this is how this worked, and it may have changed at some point in time, but um, in a normal case, you get a copy free from the other side. When you use a document depository, and the way this works, they were, they were literally putting paper documents at this site, and if you wanted a copy, you had to pay for the first copy. So this is not, this is, so agreeing. That service of PDA notices, pleadings, discovery, correspondence to counsel, that doesn't have anything to do with the document depository, at least as the record reflects. PDA notices the document depository didn't exist at the time. <clears throat> but okay, let's uh, let, let me let me come at that in this way. Then um, they didn't make they have not did not make the argument that there are 
some, if we, if we accept, which I think your question does, that there are some copying costs that are recoverable because there was an agreement to use the document depository, and that's what the statute says. It fits squarely within the statutory language. What you're pointing out, Judge Downey, is there are some copies that it looks to you like they made that don't fall within the scope of that agreement. They didn't make that objection below. And if, at best, if that's true. You argued that it was a court order, so pox well, on both of you. Well, <laughs> they didn't make, they're not, they didn't make the argument you're making, which is arguably some of them. If that's true, they didn't make it, but at best that means we get a remand to s s figure out which ones f should have fit within that agreement, um, and which ones shouldn't have. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you reverse uh, the award of uh, costs under the document depository. And again, <clears throat> what I would go back to on that is, uh, it, it fits squarely within the language, and it's, it's identical to Reyes. I mean, in Reyes, like here, there wasn't some other, you know, additional provisions. I mean, I think I think everyone would agree uh, that had the joint pretrial memorandum said uh, we're going to use a document depository and <coughs> uh, uh, the prevailing successful party gets to recover copies made from that as a taxable cost, unquestionably that would have been appropriate. And and. And really what they're saying, and this was the argument they made to Oberbiller, is the agreement wasn't specific enough. Well, Reyes rejected that argument. Reyes says, and it's because of the statutory language. Maybe the statutory language should be changed. It's pretty broad. Uh, but that's not something this court can do. I mean, their argument, though, is that we have a more specific statute that wasn't involved in Reyes that seems to prohibit copying costs as tax that's, costs. That's another argument. Let's talk about that. It's 12, uh, it's 12 uh, 333. And, and that is a statute that specifically address uh, copying costs. But uh, 12, 12, <coughs> 12332A6, by its very nature, contemplates that you're now going to be taxing something that's not otherwise taxable. That's what it does. And <coughs> 12333 does not say, does not say, notwithstanding any other statute, you can't ever treat copying costs as taxable. And 12332A6 doesn't say, except for copying costs. So in fact, 333 is the general provision. 12332A6 provides for specific exceptions from something that would not otherwise be a taxable cost. So the only way to read those two statutes in harmony is, is, is the interpretation we're suggesting here, is that when you have an agreement to incur costs associated with a depository, they become a taxable cost. To do otherwise, you're going to have to add language to one of those two provisions. I'm quiet. Unless the court has further questions. Thank you, counsel. We would ask the court to affirm the entirety of the judgment. Thank you. Mr. Nebaker. Thank you, Your Honors. Um, as much as I like the Reyes decision, we like the uh, Motzer decision as well, because basically that says it's a bright line rule. Yeah, Reyes didn't involve copying costs. I understand. Um, and 12-333 and does say what it says, but it, I mean, the analogy is, okay, why stop at copying costs? Uh, why? If we have an agreement that allows for, you know, taxable things that aren't taxable, how about the gas that, you know, somebody used to transport the copies? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a slippery slope. The bottom line is we didn't have an agreement to pay for every copy that everybody got at the document depository. If that's the case, you're going to then sort of do away with document depositories because who's going to want to do that? Um, I want to get back to the 142 houses uh, real quick. Uh, and since there's two reasons why 12 1364 doesn't apply, and, and the first one is the contract itself, we think, is specific enough and that the plaintiffs can't waive their contract and get more benefits than they had under the contract. But the second thing, and probably the more important thing is that the statute by virtue of its terms 12-1366 uh, specifically says it doesn't apply if reasonable commercially reasonable alternative dispute resolution is available it doesn't that say argument made in the superior court 
I don't think it was. They pointed that out in the answering brief, and I'm not sure you addressed it in the reply brief, but I couldn't find that argument in the Superior Court. Um, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you either, but I mean, that, that certainly is a statutory uh, interpretation of that, and, and quite frankly, um, the, the statutory scheme is to design to allow and promote uh, and as this court is well aware, the, it's, it's, it's favored arbitration, uh, and this is why it's in there. And, and the fact of the matter is, if it's available and you don't use it, you can't use 12-1364. Um, and finally, the uh, judicial estoppel argument uh, over whether or not they complied um, I, 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 you know, feel for you because I lived it and I'm still not sure exactly how it all play, played out. But I do know this, that at the end of the day, uh, we raised the issue of compliance in our answer. We raised the issue in a motion for summary judgment before fees were even considered. Uh, Judge Reyes, for whatever reason, did say that we waived that because we litigated the case for so long, uh, even though fees under Rule 54G weren't before the court at that time. We were trying to get, uh, an, I guess, an advanced ruling. But then when we tried to uh, raise this issue with Judge Oberbilling, we turned to – we, we – Oberbilling, sorry. We <laughs> – I'm just I'll, I'll keep going. Know. I know. Um, we we did raise that issue, and and the issue was, what did Judge Reyes mean when he said it was jurisdictional, and that we had waived the ability to contest their compliance, and therefore jurisdiction sat there, or jurisdiction attached, and in front of Judge Oberbilling, we had the same situation because they had said the exact opposite in another case, and in front of him. Five days before the hearing on fees, we spent a great deal of time dealing with the issue of what Judge Reyes meant and whether they complied and whether we had an obligation to respond. And it's our position is they never complied. They didn't follow the letter of the law or the spirit of the law or engage in a good faith effort to comply with 12-1364. And in doing so, they shouldn't be now rewarded with $6 million in fees. And unless you have questions, that's all I got. No, that's all. Thank you, Thank Council. You. We will um, take this matter under advisement and we'll issue a written decision in due course. Courts in recess.